So first, a couple of uh, organizing things. Um, I, I got some questions regarding uh, some of the uh, logistics of the course. So um, I prepared a little bit of uh, explanations on the wiki. <clears throat> If you have any questions, of course, you can. You should post questions to the issue tracker, uh, but hopefully those things will be kind of explained here. So uh, the course ends with the exam and the exam is in Inspera and it's electronic exam and it will be administered in school unless we have Corona and then it will be administered at home. <laughs> Uh, if it is administered at school, there will be no internet access. If it's administered at home, of course, you will have internet access. So you have to be prepared that the exam might be at school and it will be kind of with this uh, locked browser and, and so on, like you typically have the school exams, right? Um, <clears throat> the last two years, uh, the exam was actually at home. So we have to modify it such that it is with the internet access, which means the questions have to be kind of not easily lookable on kind of Stack Overflow and Google. But if the exam is at school, then it will be a little bit easier because you don't have the aids and you have to sort of uh, recall certain things. So it'll be more conceptual. Um, it, we will see, like we don't know until, you know, the end of the semester, right? So we will see what it is. Uh, usually it's a mixture of um, kind of a theory thinking, short answer questions and multi-choice and some programming. So write this function or write that function, right? So it, it is like the three parts, uh, short answers, multi-choice, and a little bit of a programming. Okay, uh, what is portfolio? So portfolio is everything you do in this course. Uh, so all the code in the repositories that you've done for the labs, all the assignments, everything that you do in the course is a portfolio. And then you get the grade for the portfolio at the end of the course. You don't get grades for the individual parts of the portfolio during the semester. You kind of package it up as in a form of a report and you submit it in the Inspera at the end of the course, and then you will get the grade. Yes? In terms of final grade, how uh, important is portfolio? 60%. Oh. Portfolio is 60%, exam is 40%. Oh. Yeah. So portfolio is quite substantial. It's like the majority of the grade, right? It is a programming course. It is quite practical. You kind of need to demonstrate your programming skills. So that's why exam is only 40% uh, with the theory and, and so on. And the portfolio constitutes 60%, right? So, um, and then at the end of the course, you will be given, I think, five or six days to submit the report. Like when the uh, Inspera portfolio opens, there is no task. You will not get any assignment or anything else to do. You will just have to submit the report, right? So you will have six days to finish up the report and submit the report. Um, so th there was a question that whether, you know, six days for the final thing is enough, especially if you have other exams. But the, the point is you will not really have anything else to do during those six days. There will be no additional task or additional assignment for you to do. Uh, all the work that you have to do, you already will know before the submission, right? So you will only have those five or six days to really submit the report uh, and organize your, all those things that you've done, right? Um, you can include anything else you've done outside of the course as long as it was Haskell or Rust. <laughs> uh, so if you've done some Python work or something else or Golang or whatever, that's fine, but you cannot submit it. But if you've done anything with Rust or Haskell, even if it was not related to the labs or anything, you can kind of say, yeah, I've done this in, in this semester or so that will count. Okay, any questions about exam and portfolio? Yeah. Uh, if we submitted labs later, does that count in portfolio? So it counts uh, the because you've done the work, right? So you will say I've done those labs, but we are, as you remember, we have this kind of, um, what is it? Extra credit thingy. Uh, so if you submit the lab on time, uh, then you are kind of listed in these tick boxes here, and then you get extra credit for being on time, right? But if you've done the labs after the deadline, you will not be here, but you can still include them in the portfolio saying, this is the, the labs I've done, yeah. Uh, how, uh, 
DX uh, rates, how uh, nice are they? Are we talking 1% to how much? Yeah, so this is a little bit unspecified. <laughs> um because we kind of don't want to totally game it like su such that uh um yeah maybe i will prepare a little guide like what is worth what okay uh i was thinking the extra credits for the labs will be worth five percent uh so five percent can tip you over a grade sometimes right um so in in the hundred percent um uh kind of a scale the grades go usually around 10 percent each right so doing all the laps will be worth roughly five percent um but i can i can write a little guide of what the percentage is it's not an exact exact science and we also um uh the way it works is we kind of grade you in a sort of absolute terms, so we don't compare you with one another. But at the same time, depending on the kind of the best and the worst students, we kind of uh, shift the scaling a little bit, right? So if the expectations are here and nobody did that and the best student is here, obviously the expectations were too high, right? And if the expectations are here and the best student is way above it, that the expectations were too wrong, right? So we kind of, usually have to adjust a little bit right based on the uh the performance of the class so um yeah we had um we had a little bit of scaling that is both for the um internal portfolio grading uh and for the exam as well so usually the exam let's say if you've done everything in the exam it's 100 percent, right and then if you've done let's say 90 you have a right but if the best student in the whole class did 75 right that means the scale, the, the exam was too hard so then we kind of scale everything and the the best student will get a and then everybody else will be kind of scaled right so that that's how it works if we were to go with the kind of um, absolute terms you would have to get every single exam and every single assessment perfect which is impossible because you know we we make mistakes we sometimes over scope or you know plan too too much but i will prepare a little bit uh but roughly speaking yeah all the labs will be worth five percent and the contribution in the course will be worth a, another two or three percent um okay so that's how this looks like um obliques so oblique is also kind of an unusual term because most of the time it means like a compulsory assignment, right? Uh, here, it, it's not an assignment. It's just like an activity that you have to do. So the oblique in this course is basically an obligatory task that everybody has to do. If you don't get a tick for the oblique one or oblique two, you will have to repeat the course. It, 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 we will not grade your assignments and we, you will not be allowed for the exam. Like obligatory tasks are something you have to do. Otherwise, you're out of the course. And obligatory tasks is kind of easy. You just need to read the books and sort of report what you've done and then get the tick from the uh, from the TA or from me. Uh, the tick will involve some kind of a short discussion, right? So we may ask you like how folds work or how recursion work or how you do guards in Haskell, right? And then if you have no idea, then you will have to retake the, the questioning, right? Um, if you if you have idea, then you get the tick and it's done, right? Uh, so there will be like a couple of uh, simple questions or, okay, simple questions, like uh, relatively straightforward questions if you read the books um, and then that's it. Um, there was a question whether obliques should have a deadline or not. And uh, initially, I don't care. Like everybody is studying with their own pace and like some people are ready later, some people are ready earlier. Uh, so I was thinking of not having a, a deadline, but maybe that's a little bit messy and maybe that will cause some problems because most people will wait until very late and then we'll have problems like getting all the ticks, right? Uh, I don't know, like it, it's a little bit up to you, but what I'm suggesting is that we align oblique one with deadline for assignment one and oblique two with a, a, a deadline for assignment two. This way we will have kind of a well-defined deadlines and then people will have to get the ticks before those deadlines. 
And then we will avoid having some sort of a headache at the end of the semester with people panicking, because this is quite important. Like the obliques, if you don't get a tick, you have to repeat the course. So it is kind of super important to for everybody to get ticks, right? Um, so if you agree with that, we stay with that. If you have another opinion, you can post like, what would you like in the issue tracker and we will do it. Like I'm very flexible. Like, I, you know, I will do whatever you guys want, right? As long as you agree and nobody objects, we can do whatever you want, right? Um, so that's uh, that's my take on this. But I think maybe it is reasonable to align those two, two dates. Um, so then about the deadlines, uh, I made a issue in the lab, in the assignment one. Uh, there is an issue uh, asking you to comment on the deadline. I proposed um, a default deadline for into which we will fall back if there is no consensus. Um, if you have a new date or new deadline, I will accept it as long as it's one and as long as nobody says, no, I don't want this deadline, okay? So if we have two, you have to agree which one. If we have more than one, if we have one, then I will accept it uh, automatically, right? So discuss among yourselves and like, if you want to change it, we can change it to a different date. Um, we did experiment in the past with no deadlines and all assignments being at the end of the semester. And I thought that's fine. Then you can manage your time yourself and you can do it whenever you want. It didn't work that well <laughs> because most people kind of waited very long to do both assignments at the end of the semester. And there was about a lot of panic at the end, right? So I think having a deadline is a good idea. But again, if you decide not to have a deadline and have all assignments at the end of the course, I will accept that as well. But then it's your responsibility, right? Uh, if there is a deadline, I think it helps you to organize yourself and kind of uh, meet the, the kind of progression. Yeah? Yeah, it, that's pretty fun. The only issue is that Laura has kind of, kind of a lot of assignments for now, and that's coming as well. So it's yep. Yeah, that deadline right there is kind of uh, harsh right now. So, but yep, you can you can change it. Yeah, exactly. So I'm 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 flexible. Uh, definitely will go with whatever you you decide, and you try to negotiate with the other lecturers such that you do have some sort of uh, space, right? Uh, as I said, the semester is kind of fixed. Half semester is fixed for everybody, for all four courses. So it, it is a little bit difficult, but I am as flexible as I can to accommodate the, uh, the things. So decide. So one, one quick note about the, uh, the study and the, the workload. Um, of course, everybody is different and everybody kind of works in a different pace and a different uh, um, uh, ad, like understanding of the material. But if you, if all the courses are kind of, let's say 40 hours per week work full time and you kind of flag, uh, so it's, it's 40 hours, right? Minus some contact time during the, the classes. So if you don't work for, two weeks, right? You decide, okay, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna take it easy for two weeks. Then suddenly you have, let's say 30 hours from the first week and 30 hours from the second week. And on the third week, you have kind of a 30 hours plus the 60 that already accumulated, right? So you have a 90 hour week to catch up, right? And it's only after two easy weeks, you kind of uh, decided not to work much for two weeks. And 90 hour week is, is a very heavy week, right? To catch up. Uh, and that's only a third week. And the semester is like 13 or 14 weeks, right? So if you flag off or if you don't work a little bit for a period of time, it accumulates. And then suddenly it becomes such a really big chunk of work that it's in physically impossible to do. So it is important that you do a little bit of work regularly, right? Um, at least, otherwise it kind of accumulates and it becomes uh, kind of a heavy burden. So anyway, uh, that's just like, you know, parent talk for you to be more systematic. <laughs> uh, all right, so what else do I prepared here logistically? Assignments, okay. So I made a change in the assignment, uh, in, in the assignments because I thought 
let's be flexible with the programming language. So assignments, there, there will be two assignments and you can do one in Haskell and one in Rust and you choose which one is which. Uh, so I don't care. Um, and then if you decide to do one of them or both of them in both languages, then it's extra. It's like kind of B and A level work, right? Uh, you don't have to do it to pass the course, but if you want to do it, you can do it. And then it, it will constitute extra work. Um, how hard would it be to re-implement something in, let's say, Rust once you've done it in Haskell? It's much easier job. You probably know it already. Like once you implemented something once, re-implementing it again is much, much shorter time. Uh, so it looks kind of like twice as work, but it's not as much. Uh, of course, it's extra work, but it's a bit easier to do uh, it second time around once you've done it once, right? Um, you don't have to do it and it's not kind of required and you can get a, um, a decent uh, mileage out of doing only one assignment in one language. Uh, because we're covering all the concepts and all the things in the labs and so on. So I, you know, it, it's not a big deal. Again, it's negotiable. Like if you don't like it or if you want this to be changed, you can tell me. Um, in in um, in essence, the way you are assessed in the course is also negotiable. You can tell me how I should assess you in the course, right? Uh, it's not. Yeah, it's not that I don't care, but I kind of don't really care, uh, all right? Um, what, what I care is that you learn Rust and Haskell and you kind of are able to use it. Uh, what grades you're gonna get or how I'm gonna assess you. I kind of don't care really. I never cared about grades when I was a student. And then when I became a teacher, I kind of stayed with that mentality. I kind of feel that grades are sort of useless in a sense, but of course we have to follow the you know, the system and you have to get grades at the end uh, and I have to assess you. But if you don't like the assessment form or if you don't like the way it is currently structured, you can tell me and we can change it. So the way you are assessed is up to you, right? The same way as you are uh, preparing the assessment specification for yourself, for the actual assignments, we can prepare a different assessment specification for the course, right? If you want, if you don't like the the one that is there, um, so I I thought making it flexible, one assignment in one language, the other one in the other language. Uh, which one you pick yourself, and then if you want to do extra work, you can do the assignments in the in the opposite language, and then the rest stays the same. Um, okay, so as you see, that there is a lot of flexibility, and it's kind of up to you. Um, I will kind of follow what, what what you decide. Any questions about the logistics or uh, about the terms? Okay, so if no questions, then let's have a look over the repo. Uh, so I, oh yeah, one more change. Um, I don't know like I can see some people doing the labs and I can see some of the progress, like how people are using different constructs and, and so on. So for example, I'm quite uh, comfortable with uh, list comprehensions because most people are, the, from what I've seen are kind of are doing pretty well. Um, but I, I don't know, for example, with the material that we already covered. So if we go here, we had this video lectures, ser series of video lectures about um, functors and uh, monoids. And I'm, I'm not sure how comfortable are you with those concepts, right? Um, because uh, most of you don't use them in the, in the labs and they may become kind of a little bit co uh, complicated. So for example, if I, if I go to GHCI, so how how comfortable are you in using that operator? Who who knows what that operator is? Raise your hand. Yeah, are you comfortable using it? Yeah. I mean the, the operator, the one with 
Just the, just the dollar sign yeah so there is no so so there are two there is just a dollar sign and there is a dollar sign in the less than more than you are familiar with both not so much not so much with the first one yeah so so the first the first one is obviously much more complicated the second one is kind of easy right um so this one um or yeah, so okay. So how about this one? <laughs> Not familiar? Right, so those like of course this one you already know all of you uh this one and this one relate to functors and to how you apply functions to functors and what the the um the how, how the functions work you have to be familiar with those and you have to be actually quite comfortable right uh there is another one which we haven't covered yet uh which is this one who who have used this one or seen this this one so this one is a bind operator. Uh, this one is a infix notation for map, fmap. Um, so if you're familiar with map, that is easy because it's just the infix notation for it. And this one is um, kind of a, a flipped fmap where the function comes um, at the different location. So if you, if you check the type for the fmap, it says, give me the function which converts A to B, gives me the functor with the A value, and I will give you the functor with the B value, right? So this is what this operator does. And this is quite straightforward because like um, if we have, uh, we, we need a unary function from A to B, right? Any function. So for example, um, plus five, right? Um, if I say f is plus five, so then if I say f 10 or 20, I'm going to get 25, right? So f is now a unary function which converts, you know, a, a number to a number, right? Uh, so I now I need a functor. What functors do you know? Yeah, for example, just or, or maybe int, right? Maybe int is a functor. It's a good functor to play with because it's the, the easiest, the simplest one. So I can have a functor uh, which is just 20, right? So can I apply f to just 20? No, I cannot because f takes a number and returns a number. And this one is a maybe number, right? It's not a number. Maybe number is not a number. So I cannot apply f to maybe number, right? Um, but I can use this operator to do exactly that, right? So if you check, um, if you check this, it says, give me a normal function and give me a functor and I will return you the same functor with the new value, which has been achieved by applying A to this function, right? So I have function A to B, I have F of F of A, and then I get you f of b. So we, we are doing it here. I have a function number to number. I have a functor maybe number. And then I get a maybe number back after applying f to the content of that, right? So that, that is pretty straightforward. So the, the dollar sign and the uh, infix map sign are kind of fulfilling the same function, right? So if I don't have a, a, a structure, if I have just a number, I can do this, right? Okay, so now if we look into the, um, this operator. Okay, this operator lives in um, data functor. 
So this operator is kind of like a flip version of the previous one because you see the signature, it takes the function as a second argument and it takes the functor as the first argument, right? And with the with this one, we have the opposite. It takes the function as the first argument and the functor on which to apply the function as the second, right? So now if we look at our like single liner, uh, we would have this, right? So I have the functor as the first argument here. And then I have a function which takes a number to a number as a second argument. And it will give me a new functor with the value modified by the function, right? So I'm gonna get the same, right? So this is equivalent to F to that, right? So now those two operators are demystified and you kind of understand how they work. So th that short detour is to tell you that if you tell me what you don't know, then we will have a lecture about it, right? Otherwise I will give you lectures about things that I think you should learn, uh, which may not be the things that you need for the labs and you need for the assignments and you still don't understand. And those are kind of really fundamental things, right? Th this is uh, like, the F map is a very fundamental thing. It pops up everywhere in your Haskell code. Um, and using those structures, using the functors and using the monads pops up kind of heavy in your code as well. Yeah. And it's really for functors in the scale book. Yeah. I did not understand what the functor was. So... Yeah. So that, that can be uh, for a while. Uh, so, so a kind of a clear understanding of what um, uh, what something is. I will show you kind of a funny. Um, so what is a monad? For example, and you have um, yeah. I don't know if this one is readable, but. This one is too small. Anyway, you, you get uh, some funny uh, stories like people like never really understanding what something is like in, in, in those mathematical terms, right? So if you don't quite understand what functor or monad is, uh, don't worry, like it's okay. You don't kind of need to understand. And I actually, I did a little bit of, uh, let me check. I did here wrote a little quote yeah here but it doesn't show up nicely so let me format that so let's make it a bullet point Okay, so what is a functor? What is applicative functor? What is a monad? Well, on kind of an abstract sense, um, all those constructs are design patterns that allow structuring your program in such a way that you remove some boilerplate, right? Um, so you can think about it as from one hand, it, it is rooted in the category theory and it follows a kind of a strict uh, category theory laws and kind of properties. And we talked a little bit about it in the lectures. And from the other hand, for the programmers, it's basically kind of a design pattern on how you structure your code and how you organize it such that you can remove some of the boilerplate uh, um, related to error handling, or to validations or to checks if something is empty and so on, right? So for example, we use maybe functor uh, or maybe monad. We, you can use it as a functor or as a monad uh, for achieving kind of a automatic handling of nothingness. 
Normally, if you have a C program and some, some value becomes nil, you have to have checks such that you don't pass nil and you don't get some sort of exceptions, right? Yeah, like with uh, reading, for example, what is from it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. So that's why we use those constructs. And both um, applicative functors and uh, monads, they have a lot of similarities. Uh, they just differ a little bit with the uh, category theory properties of what they can and cannot do, right? Uh, so there are certain laws the operators and the the, uh, the rules of those patterns follow, and then we can take advantage of that. So it's kind of like a sort of a design pattern for, for us. And some of them exist in other programming languages, which we use as well, uh, but they may not follow strictly the, the rules as in the uh, category theory, same way as in Haskell, right? Uh, so for example, Rust has um, result, which is kind of like the either um, type in Haskell or option, which is like a maybe type in Haskell, but the Rust equivalents have kind of handicapped. They, are, they don't have all the properties. So you cannot compose them the same way as we composing um, the, the structures in Haskell, right? And, uh, and also Rust has some syntactic sugar for um, like the question mark, for example, for propagating the error to the caller, right? Uh, and that is just a syntax which Rust has to kind of deal with those structures. Whereas in, in Haskell, it's just normal part of the language and you don't have any special syntax. It, it's just like it works for any structures, even the ones you define yourself, right? Um, so we will talk a little bit about monads and those things later, but if you are studying something, if you're studying a particular topic uh, and you have questions and you don't understand some things, then make an issue in the issue tracker and then we will make a lecture about it, okay? Uh, so if you uh, want to have me talk more on functors and how we use them to structure the code, we can have a lecture on that, right? Um, so I, I would like you to tell me what the next lecture on Monday should be about, and then we will make it about that, right? So what is causing problems and what is not clear? Uh, because I can kind of be going with the material forward and I will be kind of talking past your heads because you're not there yet, right? And that makes no sense, right? And I don't know like what is that you need right now because I have a limited feedback, right? So you just tell me. Um, so if some operators are causing problems, uh, let me know. Uh, I know bind operator is kind of complicated as well. So if you if you check this guy, it I mean it looks pretty straightforward because it says, okay, bind operator takes two arguments. It takes a monadic value of some sort, and it takes a function which takes a normal value and returns a monadic context of that. Of that, fun of, of that value. And then it sort of sneaks in that function inside that structure to give you M out of B, right? Um, so it's a little bit different because with the functors, you see we operating on the normal functions. So with the functor or applicative functor, we have a normal function and then we converting between the structures inside the value inside the structures. But with the monadic bind operator, we having already a little bit more complicated functions because they deal with the normal values and they give us a wrapped structures already, right? Um, it's, it is a little bit abstract. And by looking at the types, you may kind of not really get it directly, but you will get it eventually. Um, what, you know, as any design pattern, you have some sort of a construct, some sort of a generic uh, computational unit, and then you have some certain context. So like a monad gives you what you want to do and kind of carries the context around it with you such that you can do some operations and it re uh, restricts the the state to the context and what are, what are you doing with the values, right? So the easiest way to think about it is this like a maybe monad or a list also. List is kind of a, uh, a monad itself. So if you check a list, it says um, it is an applicative functor and it is a monad, right? 
So anything you, we're doing with lists, you can think like, okay, a list is a form of container which carries a certain context and then we're doing certain things on, on the list, right? So if I have a plus, plus five function and I have a list, right? I have a list of uh, two, three, four, right? Now I have this kind of a normal function and I have some form of a monadic structure, right? Uh, can I apply plus five to this to this structure directly? No, I cannot. Like the, you cannot plus five a list, right? But what if I apply the map operator? Then it kind of works. So what if I have a function which given a, a number returns returns just the number, right? So now I have um, I have a function which given a value returns a maybe value, right? So now it fits into our definition of bind. So now it find it it maps here, right? So now if I have just 10 and I bind it to my F, I'm gonna get the same. Um, okay, let, let's define F slightly more interestingly. Uh, so let's double, double the parameter, right? So if I say F, um, just then bound to F, I'm gonna get just 20, right? So it doesn't convert me the structure, but it applies that function, which is A to MB. If you play with it, you get the intuitions. You kind of get to understand how we how we're doing it. And as you watch some of the examples in the repo, you will also get to understand what those contexts are, like how we wrap those things around, especially for the world state or for the state of the program, we usually keep some sort of a monadic thing. And often you also keep a monadic thing for IO, right? Um, anyway, bottom line, tell me what you want next Monday and then we'll get a lecture on that, right? Um, this week we're doing a little bit code review. So I would like you to check the repo and check the examples that are there. Um, let's kind of uh, go roll back a little bit and um, with the, yeah, let the, this here will be easier. So go like, hello, Jack. So you have uh, started doing some APIs and some um, HTTP requests with the uh, cloud course, and um, you're doing everything in Go over there. Um, so let me see. I have uh, a very simple uh, Go program here, um, which reads, um, uh, yeah. not Rust, Go, which reads that API. So if you go, if you go to that URL, with curl or with your browser. You will see that it returns a JSON structure, right? Uh, if you go to this API uh, with the get request, it returns you a JSON. The JSON has a couple of fields, categories, uh, created at uh, icon URL, blah, 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 blah. And the last one is value. And the value is some sort of joke about Chuck Norris, right? Um, so the, the task of the program is to make a HTTP request, get the joke, parse the JSON and print the joke out, right? Um, so that's what this, um, that's what this uh, Hello Chuck program does. It goes there, um, um, fetches the joke, parses the joke and prints it on the screen, right? So now how we do it in, in Golang. Uh, in Golang, we define kind of a container, a structure for holding the content of the JSON. And then we annotate 
what are the um, what is the field and what is the JSON uh, equivalent such that the mapping between our field names and our JSON names is, is done. Why we have to do that? Well, we have to do that because for keeping the public access to the struct, all those things have to be capitalized. And as you've seen in the joke, uh, all those things are not capitalized, right? They are small letters, right? Um, so for one thing, you have to kind of do this mapping to convert those to this. And then you may have some additional conversions, like you may have here joke ID, but the ID is just ID, right? And so on. And then we have to create a request. So we're creating a request, a get request, passing the chuck up URL to the request, and then we're checking for errors. This kind of a checking for errors in Golang is very typical, right? And in a lot of languages, you're kind of doing something, checking for errors, doing something, checking for errors, right? And that is kind of the pattern which we want to get rid of using those functors, for example, right? Um, because there is a lot of boilerplate code here related to error handling, right? Um, so we're preparing the request, uh, we're doing the request, and then we um, closing the, the streams at the end. So we kind of making sure that everything is kind of uh, tidy up. Um, and then we have to parse the joke, right? So we are getting the body, decoding the body into the into our structure. And we prepared like the uh, structure here. We're doing everything very verbose, right? So in a very uh, imperative way, we kind of are creating the request, conducting the request, getting the body, and then um, parsing the, the joke. So once we parse the joke and there was no error, we have the, the content of the JSON in the joke structure, and then we can access the value out of it, right? Remember the value was the joke. So then we print it, and that's our program, right? So very simple, very um, kind of uh, imperative, and that's how it works in, um, in Golang. So let's have a look into, um, so let's have a look in Rust. Check, hello, check. Okay, so, with Rust, we also have a very simple uh, structure. We have the cargo tomo. Um, oh yeah, by the way, in, in Golang, we didn't do any external dependencies. Everything needed to run that program is built in into the language and into the standard libraries, right? So that's one of the strengths of, of Golang because a lot of times you can do all you need with the standard built-in libraries. You re reducing the number of dependencies. Right, so here the difference between um, Rust is already in a fact that we, um, sorry, that we have two de dependencies. We have a dependency for making HTTP requests. We have to access an external package to handle HTTP requests for us, and it is. Um, a package which is uh, separate from the language itself, right? It's maintained by the maintainers and it's kind of something separate. Uh, and it may have bugs and may have updates and so on. You have to keep track of, uh, of uh, dependencies. And then we are also, uh, we also need um, the library for parsing the uh, JSON, right? We need the JSON parser. So we have, uh, those two dependencies related to HTTP requests and um, JSON parsing. So now if we, if we have a look into Rust, um, it's kind of very similar, right? Um, we have uh, a struct with joke and we have those uh, the same definition as with Golang, specifying what kind of uh, properties do we have. However, there is a, a little bit of uh, uh, magic happening here because we use the deriving 
of the parsing from JSON to that struct dynamically, right? We don't declare it. We just tell the compiler to um, use those field names as the JSON names and give us the parser, which will be kind of a, a converting between the JSON and the struct automatically, right? Um, so this is done here. We have the URL and then we have kind of a three liner. Uh, and here we already see a little bit of an improvement. Um, the first line um, is a blocking call to get request, HTTP request. And we have the error handling kind of in the same line, right? We don't check if there was an error. We kind of have it built in into the single line, which is the calling the request. So the preparation of the request, execution of the request, and the error handling now is explicitly done in that single line of code, right? Um, the second line parses the joke. So the response from the request is being done here, where we are parsing the uh, parsing the response. And then the final line is the same as in Golang, where we print the joke. So you can you can look at this and say, yeah, I mean, in Golang, we had, I don't know, 20 lines of code. Here we have three. And those three are kind of more concise. And they contain this kind of uh, error handling and, and preparations and, and, and so on in kind of a more concise form, right? Um, so can we compose this error handling from this method with the error handling of the second method in a single line? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, so in Rust, you typically don't do that. Uh, Rust has not been designed to, to give you that much compressibility and composability, but it, it is already kind of a clear improvement over Golang. Golang is much more verbose, right? Sometimes you want that. Sometimes you want to be verbose, but most of the time you want to kind of handle the abstraction yourself such that when you don't need to be verbose, you want to be able to do things like this. Can you do things like that in, in Golang? No, you can't. Like you are stuck with verbo verbosity, which Golang offers and that's it, right? You cannot compose this error handling in kind of the way that it's handled here. Um, all right, so then let's have a look into Haskell. So then if we go to Haskell, um, hello, Chuck. All right, so first, let me just quickly check what the main is doing. Uh, so the main is basically, um, the, the Haskell code has been slightly differently organized because it is organized into a library and to utility function, which does the getting the joke, right? So we're getting the joke and then we're printing it, right? And see here this magic bind operator, right? Uh, which I talked a little bit about. So this bind operator is kind of the same as doing this. I will leave you to kind of think about it a little bit more, but uh, we can come back to it to this on Thursday. Uh, if you if you get this equivalence, what this is doing and what this is doing, uh, but that is not the main point here. The main point here is to see uh, source, how we handling the, um, the code, the, it, it, the code itself. So there is some boilerplate for includes or imports. Okay. The joke, um, we can see that again, it follows the same, uh, pattern as Golang and, and Rust. We have to have some structure into which that JSON is being parsed into, right? So here we're using a record notation for our data type. So we have a data type joke and we have a record, which is kind of an equivalent of a struct. Um, and we defining categories, icon URL, blah, 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 blah. And we also deriving this generic. Um, so show derives an ability for us to print it, to print that, that struct and generic derives kind of a generic description of what that struct is such that some template extensions can generate parsers and generate things for us. So it is kind of similar 
to Rust, right? Uh, and this deriving keyword is the same as in Rust, right? You can see some parallels between Rust and Haskell. Um, so we are deriving a generic description of that structure. Um, have you used the record structure in your Haskell programs already? It's very useful uh, to organize your data. Uh, you will probably have to use it for some uh, labs and some, um, and some of the assignments. Um, this is like a syntactic sugar because it defines you a type, which is a joke, and it defines you methods like categories, icon URL, ID, on that structure to extract the particular uh, values, right? So those are names of the accessors which you can do on the on the on the struct to get those appropriate fields, right? In uh, imperative languages like Golang or Rust, you do it by the dot. So you say my struct dot value, but here you would say value and the struct, and it will get you the text for the value, right? Um, we see it. Um, we see it here. We say value, and we get the value of the of the struct, right? Okay, so we have a joke, and then we have to tell the compiler to generate a code to get from JSON to the joke. And we're doing it by this, uh, by this line of code. We're telling, please generate a parser which will convert from a JSON to Jake. It basically implements this from JSON method, right? It will be automatically generated for you. You can write it yourself. Uh, but because we're using standard field names and all those things match whatever our JSON match, this is sufficient, right? Because we're not generating any jokes, we don't need two JSON generated, right? We're not going to use it. So I'm not going to call instance to JSON joke because it's currently not being used. If I were to convert from the structure into JSON, I would have to call this line as well, right? Okay, and then how are we getting the joke? Well, again, like not again, in in, um, in Rust, it was three lines of code. Here is just a one liner. Uh, we basically creating a request uh, into the um, URL and then we getting the response body. We parsing it from JSON to the structure and we getting the value out of it, right? So in that single line of code, there is a lot of magic happening. There is a lot of built-in functionality, which kind of Haskell is doing for us, right? Um, do you see any error handling here? No. All the error handling is kind of internalized and done sort of uh, by the library, which we are using for getting the URLs, and it will kind of uh, handle the errors for us already, right? Um, so we not kind of explicitly handling errors here, and we can kind of take advantage of the composability of the of the uh, Haskell functions, right? So in in Golang, we can call functions and handle errors. Call functions, handle errors. In Rust, we can call functions and handle errors, uh, but we cannot call functions, handle errors, and compose it with the other calls that we are doing. We have to have it in the separate lines, right? The composability is kind of restricted to, um, you have, um, if we look at it, in, in, uh, in Golang, we have, um, so in Golang, we kind of compose things by lines, lines of code, right? Okay, um, in, in Rust, there is an improvement because we have what Golang has, plus we have this dot, right? Which allows us to handle errors. We also have this dot and uh, question mark, right? So we can kind of compose a little bit more intricately how we kind of handle errors. And now in, um, in Haskell, we have everything these guys have. We have the kind of lines of code. We have the dot. Um, but we also have, uh, sorry. So we have the dot. Um, the dot, like, is a different dot. The, the dot in Rust is like a 
for uh, in Haskell it's a space, right? So uh, the dot in Rust is a Haskell space. Um, because the Haskell dot is what would be F G in Rust, right? That's the Haskell dot. Haskell dot does this for us. And Rust dot is just space. Plus we have this, right? You don't get that in, uh, in Rust. Um, that allows us to compose something that has kind of this wrapped context and apply to something that can trans translate it, transform it. Um, so we have those operators, which you don't get for free in, in languages like Rust. Uh, you do have fmap in, 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 in Rust. Uh, so some things you can do, uh, but this you cannot do in one line, right? So we're doing this in a single, in the single line of code. Um, so if you take this, right? So if we go to here, if we go to here, okay, so this is our main, but if we were to write, um, if we were to write uh, main, we have this, and then we binding it to put string line, right? So that, that is the code minus the boilerplate for the struct that you would have to do in Haskell, right? Uh, it's a single liner and you have this composability by space. You kind of can uh, apply functions to results of other functions. You can have composability by the dot. You have the composability by this um, flip map operator and you have the composability by the bind, right? Um, so because you can do that, you don't need to extract the value out of things and you don't need to be explicit about this extraction. Whereas in imperative languages like in Rust or Golang, you always extract. You say, give me the result, pass the result here. Give me the result, pass the result here. Is the result nil? Yes, okay, error. Is the result not nil? Okay, okay, we can pass it, right? Here, I don't care. Like I have this kind of ability to deal with computations in a very abstract way and the content, the, the values that are being passed is handled for me di directly by the structures that I'm using here, right? Uh, so I don't have to declare variables saying, oh, I have a request, oh, I have the re body of the request, oh, I have now the value out of the, 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 the request which I'm gonna print, right? I can kind of compose it. So this is a very trivial example for a very trivial problem, which in Golang is like 20 lines of code, um, but it kind of allows you to think slightly differently about computations and about how we dealing with those kind of um, generic structures of our programs. Do I need to extract this value? And every time you are extracting, you kind of um, making the code a little bit more complicated and a, a, a little bit more verbose. So in, you know, if the, um, if we look back, um, if we look back here, um, you already see that error handling here is taking advantage of that because I, I am not saying prepare me a request and if there was an error uh, and if the request uh, variable is nil, I have an error. I, I don't kind of deal here with the request instance and with the body instance, right? It's it's taken care internally by this kind of a dot. Uh, and I'm just saying, if there was a mistake, if there was an error, do something, handle it, right? Uh, so you, but I am kind of extracting this rest out of this, right? Um, could I do this line and this line in a single line? Yeah, you cannot really, right? Because you have this kind of notation where you are handling the errors 
and you cannot generically say, I want to handle errors um, like in a single line of code. Is it a big deal that I cannot do it in a single line of code? No, it's not. But it, it just demonstrates the kind of expressiveness and the power of some structures that we can use in programming, right? Um, you cannot even do this in a single line in Golang, right? You have to have multiple lines of code to achieve that behavior, right? Um, is that a big deal? Well, not, not really, but again, it, it kind of demonstrates the expressiveness and the verbosity of the language, right? Uh, in assembly, we, we hardly ever can do anything in a single line. You always need multiple lines to achieve anything, right? It's very verbose. It's very um, uh, detailed. Golang is very similar. You, you cannot achieve a lot in a single line of code. It's not very compact. It's very verbose. You're writing a lot of code. Um, and then in Rust, you, you already see an improvement. You see the kind of a compression of some of the, of the things. And Rust is liked because you have more expressive power. You can kind of express more in a more concise way. Uh, and then in Haskell, it's even better because you can combine those two lines in a single line. And this is why you use functors. You can combine those two lines in a single line because of the functors, right? All right, so that was kind of a longish uh, Chuck jokes uh, discussion and you can play with them. Uh, so all of them kind of uh, compile and work and print you uh, Chuck Norris jokes. Okay, so then um, let's have a look uh, into the hello world in Haskell. Let's go back to Haskell for uh, Haskell hello world. Uh, there are some questions. Yeah, so uh, Cecilia is asking if obliques and assignments are not the same. Uh, no, they are not the same. The uh, uh, obliques are kind of a compulsory uh, course elements that everybody has to get tick. Uh, assignments is just a normal assignment which uh, people can do to a certain degree uh, and they get part, it becomes part of the portfolio and then you get graded for it. Um, Um, so oblique is kind of the uh, tasks that you have to do and get a tick, and it's not used for anything else. Assignment is something that you do, put into your portfolio and gr get grade for. Yeah, it's not a mandatory thing. It's not a mandatory thing. And it's like from F to A, right? Because it's part of the portfolio. Uh, oblique is just a Boolean thing. It's true or false, and you have to have it. Yeah, And it is uh, obligatory. Um, yeah, so uh, also uh, Cecilia is saying that it took her a long time to set up uh, SDL and, and Haskell. Yeah, I understand that. So I, I hope everybody has everything working. If you don't, um, then t tell me in the issue tracker uh, and we will try to sort it out. Like you have to have everything working, like uh, including the SDL too. When I was building, I, I will come back to it in, in a moment. Um, so if we want specific fields and not every field of the JSON, uh, we just have to create a struct with only the fields we want. Not really. Uh, so in, it depends. Uh, in those patterns, the ones that I, the three languages that I showed you, if you have a certain struct, you have kind of a fields that the JSON will have, and you may have fields which are optional, right? Uh, the optional fields can either be there or not. So for example, in Haskell, they become maybe fields, right? Because if I have a maybe name, that means the name was either in, in JSON or not, right? But you do have to have a slot if you're using this generic way of generating the parser yourself um, by the compiler, you have to have all the fields for the struct. Um, if you want to have a situation where um, you only want to extract one field and you don't care about all the other fields, you have to write the parsing method yourself because then you will parse only that field and you will ignore all the other ones. But the generators will not do that for you because they don't know what you want, what you don't. 
So if you are missing a field in all three, um, I think in Golang, if you're missing a field, it will still work. Uh, but in Rust and in uh, Haskell, if you're missing a field, it will throw in a parsing exception. It will say, I have a JSON with a field and you don't have a struct with that field. So what should I do, right? Um, so then it will be kind of a parsing exception. So you can achieve uh, what you want, but you will have to write your uh, parsing method yourself. Okay, so those were the questions, what I was doing here. I wanted to go to the Haskell and show you some modifications. There were some um, errors, uh, not, uh, not errors, but uh, compiler warnings. So let me see. One, the compiler warning was uh, about this. So is it readable or it's too small? Okay, so we had this line of code and the compiler was complaining, right? And we did tell the compiler that the, the X is an int, right? So why the compiler was complaining here? You, you, you sort of uh, see the two points the compiler was complaining, this one and this one. So wh why the compiler was complaining? Perhaps that you're checking if it's an int when it is automatic. Yeah, so the compiler kind of saw the plus function and saw that there is an int and then it saw there is one. Uh, literals, number literals in Haskell are polymorphic. They can mean any type, numerical type. So it could be a float, it could be an integer, it could be integral, it could be kind of anything, right? Because the literals are polymorphic. Uh, so the compiler was saying, oh, uh, is that plus about adding integer to integer or is that plus adding integer to something else? Like, I, I don't know, I have to assume something, right? So I, I am assuming it's an integral, right? And that was a warning because the compiler was making a decision for you, right? What is the type of one, right? And then by annotating it, I told the compiler, treat it as integer, right? Don't, don't worry about it, it's an integer, right? Uh, so that was this plus one thing. And then there is this uh, to the power of, right? And that to the power of, again, had two. Uh, and the compiler was worrying like, what do you mean by two? Is it a float or is it uh, something else, right? Um, or is it an integer? And then by D um, being specific about what two is, the warning came went away, right? So those two are kind of, you would think, Okay, come on, it's too much, right? It's just one and two. Obviously, those are integers, right? But in Haskell, they are not obviously integers. They because the literals are polymorphic. Okay, so that was one problem. And then we had this implementation of um swap three old, um, which looked like this. Okay, so that was our original implementation which I wrote and I kind of liked it <laughs> because I checked if the length of the of the list is three, uh, it is different than three. And if it is different than three, I have an error. So I'm returning an empty list. Otherwise I'm doing this pattern matching, right? So I know in the second line that my list, my XS cannot be different than three of length because that's what I've already checked in this guard here. Right, so in this line, it's impossible for XS to be of different length than three. I know that, right? But the compiler is dumb and the compiler doesn't know that, right? You will see that often with Rust, like you know something, but the Rust compiler will complain like, oh yeah, maybe this will happen. It's like, no, it will not happen. I, I kind of see it, but the compiler doesn't see it. So the compiler was complaining, look, uh, XS can be different length and you're doing a pattern matching only of length three. So what happens with the other cases, right? And that was a warning saying, um, this is kind of a bad code, right? Is it my fault? Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe it is my fault. 
even though the compiler is wrong, right? The, the, there is no possibility here for access to be of different length than three. Um, but then I don't like compiler warnings. Like you, you also should not like compiler warnings. So I thought, okay, can I do this in a different way, right? And this is the new implementation, right? So the new implementation says, if the given list is of length three, swap the, you know, the two uh, edge elements. If it's of any different length, treat it as an error, right? Um, and I kind of like this implementation now more, right? Uh, this implementation is easier to read, it's clearer, and the compiler is also happy. The compiler says, oh yeah, perfect, pattern matching, and you exhausted all the patterns, all the possibilities, right? So the compiler is happy, and I think this one is clean, cleaner too compared to this one. This one is a little bit more imperative, like I'm checking the length explicitly here, kind of myself, and that is this is unnecessary because this can be done by this pattern here. The length is being checked automatically by the pattern itself, and I'm, I have a very clear logic of what is happening, that we're doing the swap of A and C, right? Um, so I, I rewrote it to this to make it uh, warning free and kind of nicer. Um, again, not a big deal, right? Uh, but the, the complexity kind of creeps in. The moment you start having a little bit of complexity, it kind of builds up. All right, so those, this is the hello thing. Um, and what else do we have? Uh, we have now um, the infamous um, 01 SDL hello which should compile on Windows. Um, let me know how it goes. Uh, it does compile. So if I, uh, on Windows, you have to use Cabal. Here I can use, um, I can use uh, Stack and I already have it pre-compiled. So it just runs and it draws two squares, uh, three squares and prints the text. Uh, and I've done the same thing in Rust and then because in Rust, I've done it slightly differently. I will show you. Uh, uh, where is my Rust? Okay, so almost everything, like the API is different. Uh, the API for accessing SDL things is different in Rust than it is in, um, in Haskell. So one note about that. We have a C uh, API for SDL2. It's written in C. And the documentation defines all the constructs and all the subsystems of how SDL is used. And then you have wrappers. You have a Haskell wrapper, which is derived automatically by a tool which generates a Haskell API based on the C API. So it kind of reads the C API and generates all the Haskell stuff for you automatically. Uh, and then you have a um, cargo, which is the package for Rust, which has been manually crafted. And this manually crafted package is using kind of a data structures and calls, which follow the model of what the um, uh, Rust is using. So the API is slightly, slightly different. Um, so we have, um, we kind of are drawing the uh, background uh, color to white. Then uh, let me see where I set this. Yeah, here. So here I'm kind of like clearing the screen and setting it all to white. Then I'm handling the events and then I'm uh, drawing the two uh, thin red stangles and then the filled one. And we're doing it on, on the canvas. And then when, we when it comes to drawing the text, uh, we drawing the text into a text, into a, um, into a surface 
which we then convert to a texture. Uh, and then we um, use the uh, copy mechanism for kind of uh, copying the texture onto the, the main surface of the window, right? Um, that, was, that code was different than Haskell because in Haskell, what we were doing, we were drawing the rectangles and then we were going to the uh, printing the text. We're getting the window surface and we're drawing the text directly onto the window surface and updating it. Um, and that had a side effect of us updating the screen kind of twice when drawing the squares and when drawing the text. And that resulted in a bit of a flickering between the rectangle and the text, which was uh, kind of uh, undesirable. So I rewrote the Haskell code to do exactly this way now. So it also prints to a surface, gets the texture out of that surface, and then does the copy, right? So it's kind of a line by line compatible uh, because I'm, I'm basically doing the same in Haskell as we are doing here in the in Rust uh, implementation, right? So it, it's a very simple demo of how to do um, square printing and text printing on the on the screen using SDL, and then how to obtain the different uh, subsystems, right? Um, you will see that the API is different, and in Haskell, a lot of things live in a kind of a top level functions. Uh, you have a lot of functions on the kind of SDL dot uh, level. Here you're kind of living with the particular subsystems. So we have the uh, event subsystem, uh, renderer, uh, and so on and so forth. You have to do some kind of a more specific imports and kind of get to a particular place in the API. But the API is quite nice. And for example, dealing with colors, um, you have this kind of a color RGB. And then you're specifying the uh, the colors in kind of a nice way. In 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 Haskell, those are all uh, vectors of four dimensions, right, or three dimensions. And we use v4 or v2 to represent them. And it feels kind of a little bit more ugly. Um, so the SDL01 is a very kind of a hello world code, very imperative in Rust and in Haskell of how to do things and how to do event loop. So this is the uh, kind of a fundamental um, implementation. And then um, let me go to, in Rust, I don't have 0, 03, but in Haskell, we have 0, 03. And 0, 03 is kind of doing a little bit of refactoring. I haven't done this refactoring entirely myself. I've used the uh, example from the SDL Haskell code um, and they've organized it into two files. You have the common file, which prepares all the boilerplate code, which then you use in your uh, implementation to achieve the behaviors that you want. And this refactoring is um, done in such a way as to abstract away some of the fun common functionality such that you will kind of um, uh, deal with it in a more flexible way. So in this case, um, obviously we have some utility methods, like we have some methods for making a point or making a rectangle uh, to prepare the SDL uh, data structures. That this is what I was talking about, like a V2 uh, or V4, um, but then we also have some uh, more high level functions using this kind of a monadic constructs, right? So we have a function which is called with SDL and with SDL, we pass it an operation and then what it do, what it does, it's, it initializes the SDL subsystem, conducts the operation and then quits the SDL subsystem, right? So we kind of wrapping around uh, the context in which our operation will work. And we can then say with SDL, do something, right? So if, if you go, um, if you go to the main, you will see that in main, we say, with SDL, do, and then we're doing the logic, right? So we kind of try to abstract away some of the boilerplate by a function, 
and then pass to that function the operations that are actually the essence of what we want to do, right? Is that very different to Rust? Um, not really, like in Rust, um, if I were to, so let's say, abstractly speaking, if I were to do it in Rust and I had my main function, sorry, I would have something like uh, in it and then uh, do stuff, right? And then I would have um, clean up, right? I would do kind of do something like this. And then here I would define do stuff, right? And I would have my kind of a uh, business logic done here such that I abstract away all the boilerplate uh, and all the kind of a boilerplate stuff that I'm doing here. And I will focus on what I'm actually, what I want to do, right? So or organizationally wise, uh, what we're doing in, um, in, in Haskell is similar to what we would do with, uh, with Rust, but we kind of do use higher order functions and we pass functions like this is basically passing a function to this function and to this function, right? Um, and also you can see that uh, with SDL image and with SDL, they both create kind of a certain <laughs> container, certain environment. And this environment is kind of pass up, up to the, um, to the chain, right? So I have, um, I have, with SDL image, which kind of initializes the SDL image subsystem and with SDL, which initializes the um, uh, SDL itself. And then in both cases, I'm passing an operation and in both cases, I'm returning kind of a, a monadic construct, which is being passed around. So with the main, when I'm doing the operation with SDL image, I'm actually doing it like this op and this op is the same op, but this op here has now two layers of wrapping. One wrapping is inside the SDL image and one wrapping is inside SDL itself, right? You see, it's kind of like an onion, right? So I have to initialize SDL, then I have to initialize SDL image, and then maybe I have to initialize my world or something, and then I'm kind of doing the business logic. And it kind of lives like in a tower of uh, dependencies, right? Um, in normal, in, in Rust, you typically don't do that this way. You typically flatten it and you say, I have my subsystem one, subsystem two, subsystem three, and then do something with subsystem three and do something with subsystem one, and you're kind of more explicit of the hierarchy. Here we kind of doing it by by this nesting, right? And it's very typical to do this type of nesting with the monadic operations. Why? Because then we can kind of very nicely compose things. We can very nicely compose how things work. Um, so this is not for uh, oblique one, and this is not for uh, assignment one. This is something for the second half of the course. But I want you to already study and try to understand how this code works and what you don't understand such that we can focus on it, right? Um, the, uh, if we go to the main, what we want, you know, effectively what we want to achieve when we're doing, um, when we're doing kind of a imperative programming is to have a relatively short main with relatively clear logic of what is happening, like some initialization, doing some stuff and cleaning up. The, the main loop will be kind of here. And we kind of happy with, um, I don't know, 10 lines of code here, right? If, if main is, you know, 20 lines of code, you will be like thinking, yeah, I should refactor it. I should have it simpler, right? Uh, so the, the ultimate goal is to have it kind of a reasonably short main where things are kind of uh, uh, clean. And you're doing it by structuring your code into functions and kind of organizing it such that it, it is easy to maintain and easy to kind of uh, substitute things, right? Ultimately, what we're doing with Haskell is similar, but we want 
to basically have a single liner, right? You want main to say main equals, and then you have like a, a single line of code, which does something. Here, we didn't achieve that. We have this do, which is which could be set as a external function, right? Uh, so, uh, so then we would say with SDL and with SDL image, do the business logic. And the business logic is this uh, lambda, is this function which we are kind of doing here, right? This lambda is relatively short. Um, so that's why we have it inlined, right? Um, so what we're doing here, uh, we loading the texture with info. Um, we are preparing the do render function. And then we have the main loop, same as we have in Rust. We have the main loop, loop which does that forever until the exiting function tells us to stop, right? Um, and this structure here, it's, it's quite simple. Um, so we kind of doing this um, until we want to quit. And then when we quit, we destroy the, the texture. Um, so I don't think you should have much problems understanding in general what this does, but this one, this one is non-trivial, right? Um, especially this lambda, okay? So I want you to kind of try to understand why do we have a lambda here and how this line works, right? And it is like, you kind of need to think a little bit um, uh, how, that, how that works and why we're doing this kind of business logic in a single liner. Um, you cannot do this. You cannot do this in a single line in Rust, but you can do in Haskell. Um, so I will do, so now like uh, SDL1 is the same in Haskell and Rust because it's very uh, imperative. It, it's like an equivalent, right? If you're comparing SDL1 and SDL1 in Rust and Haskell, they are the same. But SDL3 cannot be the same. We cannot do, we cannot code SDL3 the same way in Rust than we did in Haskell. Um, we have to do the Rust implementation of SDL3 in a Rust way, right? So programming languages are kind of like countries. Like when you move to a country, the language is different, the culture is different, the concepts are different, people think differently. And when you're doing kind of Rust, you have to switch to Rust. And if you're doing Haskell, you have to switch to Haskell. And if you're doing Golang, you have to switch to Golang. Some of it is related to the language itself because the language doesn't allow you certain things, but some are, things are related to just concept and constructs of how we can use them, right? With Haskell, we have all this monadic beauty and all these monadic things that we can use and functors. And in Rust, we have a little bit of it, but not that much. And we have to be a little bit more verbose and much more um, structured in this kind of fashion, right? Um, so I haven't done the example of SDL3 in Rust yet, because I kind of need to think like how to structure it such that it feels kind of nice, right? And also about SDL1. SDL1 can, like everybody can do it. SDL1 is kind of the way which you start, okay? It's not a, a nice code. It's a very kind of a spaghetti long type of code. SDL3 supposed to be nice, but it is very subjective, right? Uh, whether this structure is nice or not, it's kind of very subjective, right? We can use some objective metrics like how easy is to make a modification, how hard is to make a bug, how many lines of code do we need to maintain, and so on. We can use some objective metrics, but it still is a very subjective way of organizing it, right? Um, so what I'm saying is that SDL3 is not the only way of doing uh, um, this type of architecture. You can make your own and you may feel your, your one is better because it feels more intuitive to you and, and so on. And that's fine. It, it, it is, you know, um, there is a, an art element to, to all of that, right? It's not just engineering. Um, so if you have a better idea or if you have a kind of a nicer way of organizing something, you should try it out. 
and then you should post it um, so we can kind of discuss it and we can um, compare, right? Uh, same as there is no one way of doing this uh, swapping, right? We, we've seen two implementations and maybe objectively the late, later one is better, but you know, so it's the same here. If you are organizing your main loop, your main kind of uh, function, and you feel it's better organized than this one, then share it. We can kind of learn from it, right? Uh, and for the assignments and for the labs, it's a uh, fair play to, to experiment and to use something else. Um, all right, so then, um, yeah, when compiler is happy, we are happy. Uh, yeah, the color looks similar to SFML with C++. I would say so. I would say some uh, some of the constructs and API for SDL2 in, um, and Rust will be similar to SFML. Um, <laughs> yeah, and there is a joke about SDL3 that it's, it's gonna be terrible. Uh, it probably is gonna be terrible. I am surprised how hard it is to get SDL to work. Um, so anyway, when I uh, have this um, SDL1 example in Rust and I did cargo run or cargo build, uh, guess what? It didn't build. Um, may maybe it will. Um, it will not build here neither. So cargo purge. No cargo clean. Um, yes, you see, I have the error. And the error says um, the linker cannot find the SDL2 library, right? Uh, so I was like, shit, again, same shit as on Windows, right? Uh, kind of same same problems. Um, so if I do, I have, um, I do have my SDL um, binaries and the bin folder in my path such that I can run SDL2 config, right? And if I do that, uh, you can ask it where my lips are. So you can say, where are my lips? And then it tells you that um, the compiler should get this line um, together with this line, such that it knows where to load the SDL2 from. And if you look into this, um, it seems they don't have this line which means the compiler subsystem doesn't know where to fetch the library from. So then what you need to do is you need to kind of do export um, library path equals um, library path. Okay, and I like to make it second. And then I would do this. Ay, 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 ay. Like this. So now if I, let's see if my library path is set. No, it's not. I did something wrong One, once again. Okay, let's put it in quotes. Export. My library path now is including that homebrew lib folder. So now if I say cargo build, it linked, it clicked that the libraries are there so it could build it. So if I say cargo run, it will um, do the SDL1 example in um, in Rust. Okay, so just one final thing. Uh, I made in both examples the windows resizable, right? And it's quite nice because when you're resizing the window, you can see that it um, the texture, which is the current window state is being nicely resized. And then when you stop, 
it kind of redraws the content and the redraw functions, they use absolute positioning and absolute dimensions. So they don't rescale it to the size of the window. They always draw the same thing the same way with the same size, right? So if I make it really big, it still is the same as the original and so on, right? Um, so should you use the absolute positioning or should you use a relative positioning and scale it to the content uh, based on the resizing of the window? Obviously doing it this way is much easier because you just kind of don't need to calculate much. You don't need to rescale anything. Uh, if you try to do it kind of to, to, to work with the scale, you have to kind of work out yourself, like what do you want to scale? What do you want to be fixed? and how you want to do it, right? It's not required. I, I would just go with the kind of a fixed uh, things just for simplicity. You can always refactor it later and make it more complicated, but start with something simple first, um, same as, as, it, as this one is. And also if you look at into the print, uh, the P and the rectangle, there is no flicker anymore. I don't know if you've seen it on your systems, but with the previous Haskell implementation, there was kind of a little bit of a flicker here. All right, so that's it. Uh, we will continue on um, on Thursday and please try it out. Try both Haskell SDL2 and the uh, Rust one and make sure that you can get it going on your platform. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to follow your like SDL2 instructions. Yep. And when I run the 